to not stop the car and go check. But that's what a lot of people do. They get the signal and they don't check. If you're in Hawaii already and you've just flown there, I don't expect you to go back to your house and check. But if it's cheap, meaning if it's an inexpensive precaution to apply, you go back into the house, you check the stove, and guess what? The fire's not on. That'll happen. That will happen. And it also, in my experience, something else will be revealed to you that was important. Oh, there's the briefcase I needed for this presentation, and I had left it behind. Typically, the, your mind does not, your, your mind, in terms of intuition, does not waste your time. Now, there's another kind of thing, which is worry and anxiety. Those are a different animal. I'll talk about those in a second. They're quite different. But uh, what I'm encouraging here is that we do not spend critical mental resources during an emergency uh, cross-examining our own feelings and, and trying to persuade ourselves that it isn't so. I interviewed a woman, I mean, it's an almost unbelievable story, but it's a true story, that she was grabbed from behind while she was going into her apartment by a man in Los Angeles, and he was wearing a ski mask. And as she turned around and saw him, the very first thought that went through her mind consciously was, oh, it's somebody who's going skiing. Forget that it's summer, forget that it's Los Angeles. Her, her first wish, her conscious wish was, it won't be what I think it is. Even though her body had already made the decision entirely, she'd already stepped back and it was one of those apartment houses with a railing uh, that he fell over. So. She, her mind was way behind the physical reaction. It's a little bit like, like doing that when there's a bee in your hair. You do not say, ah, I feel what might be a bee in my hair. I think I'll move my hand up and push it out of my hair. You was, you've already responded long before you realize why. And, uh, and that's something that uh, is so valuable. In how does your mind communicate with you? How does intuition send signals to you? And it's not different for, I mean, it's not the same for all of us. <coughs> Some of us get nagging feelings or have a hunch or have doubt or suspicion uh, uh, or, uh, you know, gut feelings or persistent feelings. Those are ways that the that intuition communicates with you. One of the best ones is curiosity because curiosity is simply the signal from your intuition that says there's something more here I should learn. In the context of, of violence and, and risk and danger, it's very useful, but in everything it's very useful. Curiosity, there's something more here I have to learn. And so I'm curious and I ask you a question, are you from Boston? And then a conversation begins and we go on. Are you from Boston, by the way? Okay, good. Uh, the, you're from Boston? I knew it was one of you. All right, so uh, suspicion is another signal from intuition, suspicion. And that's one that we often feel guilty about. I don't want to be suspicious of this person. But suspicion is exactly the same as curiosity, with only one small difference. It has the directive that you keep watching. It's the same animal. Curiosity is that there's something more here. Suspicion is that there's something more here, and I should keep watching. And in fact, what is the root of the word suspicion? It is suspicer, which means to watch. To watch. And so there's nothing wrong with suspicion. You have suspicion about the nanny that you hired to watch your kids, and you think, oh, I don't want to be suspicious of her. It's like you're doing something hurtful to her. You're not doing anything to her. You're just getting a piece of information. Your, your curiosity is stimulated. And rather than go like this and want to get away from it, you can be open to it and say, I wonder why that is. And it might be you'll conclude the nanny's terrific and everything's fine and you go on. Suspicion is not something you choose. It's something that chooses you. It comes to you. You do not choose to be suspicious. And so uh, all of what I'm sharing is to encourage you to listen to these signals. Doubt, curiosity, hesitation, suspicion, uh, nagging feelings, dark humor. Dark humor is a great one. In my whole career, I've had so many cases where people uh, ignored the messenger of dark humor. Here's an example of one. There was a, there's a California association called the California Forestry Association, a bit controversial at times because they're cutting down a lot of uh, forests, and so they get uh, adversaries who make threats or, or uh, cause them problems. And there was a day in the California Forestry Association where the, the uh, receptions didn't come to work. So all the men who ran the organization were there with the mail arriving. And the mail had arrived with various packages, and one of them, the men shook one of the packages and says, gee, who's this from? Does anybody know this? And he looked at the package, and he, they all talked about what they should do with it. 
because it was addressed to the former president of the California Forestry Association. Should they, should they send it to him? Should they keep it? What should they do with it? And then they began to be suspicious about the package. Why would somebody send a package here for the former president? He's been gone for two years. And at that moment, Gilbert Murray, who was the new president of the association, he arrived at work. He said, what's up? They said, this package, it's kind of weird. We, we don't recognize who it's from, and we don't want to open it. And he said, cut the bullshit. And he took the package, and he walked into his office. And one of the men, Robert Thompson, who was there, said, I'm going back to my office. I don't want to be here when it blows up. And everybody laughed. It was a joke. It was dark humor. And he got about 10 paces down the hall before it blew up and killed his boss, Gilbert Murray. That was the second bomb sent by the Unabomber. Uh, those of you old enough in the room to know the Unabomber will know that he sent a whole bunch of bombs. Now, the idea here isn't that we should all be thinking about bombs every time we receive a package at our homes, but the point is they were thinking about it. Right? He did say in the clearest possible language, I'm going back to my office, I don't want to be here when it blows up. You can't get any clearer than that, but it was a joke. <coughs> now, where do those jokes come from? If you were just looking to say, I think I'll say something funny right now, uh, you might say maybe it's a package that was, you know, maybe it's a fruitcake lost in the mail from two years ago. Uh, you, could, you could come up with anything. But this was not a, a man who tasked his mind to come up with something funny to say. Rather, this is a thought that arose. There it was. It was so ridiculous a thought, so extreme a thought, that it forms humor. It would be funny to say it. Some of our best humor are things that uh, are a bit shocking to say. What's the primary element of humor? Surprise. And so that dark humor was a very important signal. There's another case of, a, of, a plant, uh, of uh, an industrial um, plant in California called Standard Gravure. A bunch of employees were sitting around. They heard some noises outside the lunchroom. And one of them said, that's probably Joe Westbecker coming to finish us off, because he'd been a fired employee two weeks earlier. Of course, it was precisely Joe Westbecker coming to finish them off, including shooting and killing the man who said, that's probably Joe Westbecker coming to finish us off. And so dark humor is really a good thing to listen to, because inherently, if you think about dark humor, it's not all that funny. Meaning, if you, if you take it and you know, change the context, I'm meeting with a client somewhere, and I say, I'll see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And he says, if I'm not dead by then, it's not, in, it's not wildly funny. I usually sit down and say, where'd that come from? And we talk about it a little bit more because I'm, I'm dealing with people who are, you know, wanting to talk to me because they're at risk of being harmed. So it's, it's, uh, it's it, I'm not saying I don't chuckle at dark humor. I, I like it a lot. But the point is, you listen to it when it comes out of nowhere. And all the, the two victims I described to you just now both had all the information they needed to make the assessment. The package sent to the California Forestry Association had oil stains on the outside of it. It was bound with two kinds of tape. It had a return address that wasn't complete, and it was sent to a controversial organization during the time that the Unabomber was sending bombs and was in the mail. And so it's not crazy that somebody thought this could be a bomb. Um, now, the most urgent messenger of intuition is fear, true fear. And there is a, a difference between true fear and unwarranted fear. Uh, and I'll, I'll share that in a moment. But what I want to say about true fear is what is its purpose in our lives? Uh, I don't mean the fear that I'll fail the class or the fear that this girl won't go out with me or the fear that I'll lose my job. Those are worry. Those are a different animal. True fear is a signal in the presence of danger. A signal in the presence of danger. And it's meant to be brief. <gasps> That is true fear, in the presence of danger. If you have fear about something that is not present, that is usually anxiety or worry. Right? For example, imagine you pick up the phone and somebody says, I'll kill you. I'll kill you tomorrow. I hate what you did and I'll kill you. Now, in fact, that's a death threat, right? Very scary to people. Your heart could start racing, etc. But I say to people, you could not get a better phone call. Uh, then, uh, you know, somebody who says, I'm going to kill you, but is on the telephone is about as undangerous as it could be. I mean, you have no emergency. The very fact that they're on the telephone is meaningful. They're distant. The very fact that they're choosing to tell you is interesting. They're choosing, they thought about hurting you, and they chose words that alarm over actions that harm. They had a choice. What do people really do when they intend to kill you? They kill you. They attack you. And so the idea that threats are inherently, uh, uh, should be fear-provoking, is one to consider. Because 
according to the standard I've just provided, it cannot be a signal in the presence of danger. It can make you anxious. It can give you worry. But it's not the same thing. Now, I want to tell you what happens when you feel true fear. I don't mean the fear you get in a movie, uh, but the real thing. What happens is it can literally take over your body, and fear will fairly instantly, in an emergency, stop time for you. And it, it either stops time or it speeds up time, whichever one you need, but ultimately time is forgotten, and everything is forgotten. And in those moments, those instances, life is no longer lived in the form of seconds. It's divided into milliseconds. And every tiny action that you might take is now under the control of these ancient internal guardians that I've been talking about, that have been basically waiting deep in your cells for this kind of emergency. And the heart rate will instantly jump. It can go to 200. And uh, it, it does that for a good reason. It needs blood very quickly to get to the muscles. And then lactic acid will go to the muscles to pump them up to get ready for combat. And uh, uh, there's a cocktail of powerful chemicals that happen. You all know the famous one, which is adrenaline, a brain chemical. But most people don't know the more interesting one, which is called cortisol. And cortisol gets pumped into your body immediately, a brain chemical. And what it does is cause blood to clot. It causes blood to clot more quickly in the event you are cut. That's its purpose. And your muscles actually harden for resistance, for physical resistance, a form of armor. All of these things happen when you believe you're actually in the presence of danger and you're actually getting ready for combat. You can run faster. You can run farther, naturally, if you're being chased by something that wants to hurt you. And the five senses will take off. They'll start running in every possible direction and sending back information to your brain. And normally when you have, uh, let's say I come into this classroom or you see me, all of the senses are involved, but we'll use one particular sense and focus it. I'm looking at you. But what happens in an emergency is all of that is overthrown. And all of the senses work together. And it may feel absolutely chaotic, but it's anything but chaotic. And if you let it, if you don't deny it, fear will get you out of most emergencies. And fear can get you to do things that you would never do in any other circumstance. In a sense, fear directly equals courage. Directly, direct connection. Uh, there's a man I interviewed, an Australian man, who was attacked by a great white shark. Bad news. And um, fear gave him courage to do something that, that most people would never do. He was swimming in the water, and he realized he was moving tremendously fast. That was his impulse. I mean, that was the first impulse that came into his head. And he looked down, and he saw the entire head of a great white shark clamped onto his body. And he immediately, without thinking, doesn't know anything about sharks any more than any of us here, he began to caress the top of the shark's head like this, looking for the eyes. And when he found them, he put both his thumbs in very quickly, all the way in. He said they were like eggs. They just went right in. And the shark let go of him. But he held on to the shark as it swam down deeper. And he said later that he did that, he thinks, because he didn't want it to bite him again. He felt more comfortable hanging on. And it took him deeper and deeper and deeper, and then he pushed off, and he swam up through his own blood and bubbles to the surface. And with 1,600 stitches, he lived. In other words, he did something that no one in this room, myself included, would ever volunteer to do on the basis of logic. But fear equals courage allowed him to do that. And intuition gave him all the information he needs. Perfectly logical if we think about it now. A shark has eyes, the only vulnerable part on his body. I can reach his eyes. I mean, I, I wouldn't think about it logically in that emergency, but he didn't have to because he reacted immediately as a result of intuition. So if you think of fear as being a brief signal in the presence of danger, then it's obviously uh, something to listen to. Now, I said a moment ago that anxiety is a different thing entirely. How do you tell the difference between anxiety and worry and true fear? True fear, unwarranted fear. Here it is. Unwarranted fear will always be in response to something you imagine or something you remember. Unwarranted fear is always based on something in your imagination or your memory. And true fear is always based on something in your environment, something you sense or in your situation. But unwarranted fear is always based on your memory or your imagination. Real world example, you go to the airport, you're getting on a plane, 
and uh, you get that impulse, don't get on the plane. This plane's going to crash. Uh, what's it based on? You ask yourself, where do I get that from? Ah, that news story I saw two weeks ago about that terrible plane crash in Peru, that terrible footage, whatever it is. But if you got that reaction because you just saw the pilot stumbling drunk out of the bar at the airport, that's a different thing. That's in your environment. That's something you perceive in your environment. And the, the, so you can quickly tell the difference between unwarranted fear uh, and, and true fear. And the unwarranted fear, anxiety and all of that stuff, is, is very, very bad for us. Um, Emily, give me a feel for how much more time you want me to talk. I think there's questions, so maybe talk for two or three more minutes and then open it up for questions. Okay. Um, so a fast thing, staying on emergencies. <laughs> Knowledge is not particularly valuable during an emergency. Knowing stuff. Uh, because data is general. And emergencies are highly specific. And data is old. And emergencies are always right now always current. And that's where you have to be in a real emergency is to be in the now uh, and to detect pre-incident indicators of violence. You need to be present now. You could think of that word as pre-sent. You need to be there before your predator is there, ideally. And you can be certain that your predator, someone attacking you for some reason or, or choosing to victimize you, is absolutely present in that moment. He is not thinking about uh, American Idol. He is not thinking about Syria. He is thinking about you and this action. And so the importance of being fully in the now uh, is, is key. And fear will get you there if you let it. There is nothing that will get you more into the now than fear. And that is a truth that is widely abused by the news media. Because the news media is feeding our intuition information, which is actually false frequently, meaning things that are not dangerous to us because they're too far away, I can't be burned by the fire in Mexico City, or they're too, too rare, I can't be uh, affected by the one tainted turkey that was sold in Los Angeles last Thanksgiving and six, other, six million other people live there. But the news headline on CBS News says, could your family be next? True answer, no. Statistically speaking, it is literally zero percent that my family will be next in getting the, a tainted turkey. Just like, uh, you know, cougar attacks campers. Could your family be next? No. Because statistically speaking, that never happens on Earth. Yeah, it happens three or four times. But out of billions of people on Earth, that equals never. That equals no risk, no chance of me being attacked by a cougar while camping. Uh, and so it's important that we keep our intuition accurately informed and not buy into the idea that the local news, which is a business, will tell us what to be afraid of and program our fears. Mad cow disease, you're not getting it. Flesh-eating disease, you're not getting it. Uh, uh, killer bees coming from South America, not coming. So the local news, I've thought, should just begin the broadcast by saying, welcome to the Channel 2 News. We're surprised you made it through another day. <laughs> and here's what happened to the people who didn't. And then they begin the death litany, the list of all the things that happened to a few people in a giant city like New York City in order to hold our attention. Vacuum cleaner dust kills four-year-old. Expert, next up. Oh, well, I have a four-year-old, and so I think I have to watch that vacuum cleaner dust. And it turns out to be that a child put a vacuum cleaner bag over his head and suffocated. How many times in the history of the planet Earth has it happened? Once. Once. Or a child's arm taken off in, in, a, in a laundromat. And the, you know, the local assemblyman is out there saying, we have to do something about these laundromats and their safety concerns. And it's the top story on the local news in a city of 7 million people. And so that, what I encourage you on this is to get your information about risk when you seek it out, as opposed to when somebody tries to spit it at you through the local news. True story with me. I, I, I was on an airplane and I was... Uh, watching a guy sitting across the aisle talking to the 17-year-old girl who was sitting next to me. She was flying alone. And he said to her, he was putting on headphones, and he said to her, I just can't get these things loud enough with some sort of passion behind it. And she kind of reacted a little bit. And then he said, where are you going? And, uh, and she said, I'm, I'm going into Chicago. And he said, boy, I hate landing in an airport, and I don't know if anybody's going to be there to pick me up. This time I've got nobody picking me up. She said, me too. Because what he said was a question, is anybody picking you up? But he said it in this 
you know, this more clever way. And then uh, he said, uh, hi, my name's Billy. And he put his hand out. That's a question, too. What's your name? And she answered it. And then he engaged her a bit, and he had a drink, an alcoholic drink, and he said, here, he handed it to her, and she didn't want it. And he said, come on, you're traveling by yourself, you're old enough to do what you want. And she took it, and she had a little sip. And I knew the whole thing was bad, right? In context, it's a bad circumstance. A nearly 50-year-old man talking to a young girl on an airplane with, a, with an energy that didn't feel good. If she were my daughter, I'd say, please leave her alone. And so I gave him a look, a sustained look, and he looked back at me and he said, getting out of Chicago? And uh, I sort of nodded, and I really looked at him. Crisp new jeans, muscular body, just out of prison. Right? That was the energy that I got from him. And so he got up to go to the bathroom. And coming to your question, I said to her, may I speak with you for a moment? And she became tense. Fantastic, right? She's not afraid of the guy giving her alcohol, <laughs> but she's afraid of me. And so that's her learning is basically a lifetime of uh, be concerned when somebody makes an, uh, an unsolicited approach to you. But he'd gotten around all that through the strategies that he used. Uh, I said to, she, uh, she said yes, uh, when I said may I speak with you, and was a little bit put out by the whole idea that, that I would want to talk to her, but not put out that he would. And I said, uh, that's not a good guy, that guy sitting over there. And he's going to ask you, uh, he's going to offer you a ride home. And the next thing I saw, we landed, she didn't really engage with me, and we landed, and I saw the two of them talking at the luggage carousel, and she was walking away, and he was pissed off. There was an energy of anger. So hopefully, she didn't accept a ride and share a, share a taxi, whatever his thing was. And you know, some predictions are very, very easy, because I don't need to know he was in prison. I don't need to know that he, he was giving alcohol to a young girl. I, all of that is, is, can be set aside. Just context alone will allow you to make the entire prediction, which is 50-year-old man, 17-year-old girl don't know each other. You're really done at that point. And, uh, hey, phone's ringing. Um, the, uh, so uh, that's what happened, uh, which is ho hopefully that nothing happened or nothing adverse happened. I'll speak just generally about everything I would say to young women. I have two daughters uh, who are now in their 20s. And, uh, y you know, my, my overarching recommendation for women is to recognize that it is not a requirement that you be nice. That, uh, and when people are nice to you, niceness is often a strategy. It's not a feature of a human being, like how tall they are or what color hair they have. It's not just a fe I'm just a nice guy. Because I'm not a nice guy in a different context. I'm a nice guy in a particular context. And typically, particularly when you're talking about romantic engagements and the beginning of them, the seduction, the asking you out, etc. Of course they're nice. What, what's the alternative? And so niceness is a strategy, and it is not a feature of a human being. And you can think of, uh, of, uh, of the, the, you know, the issue that women are discouraged in this culture from saying no, in general. And even when they say it, they're not really heard. So in Western culture, when a woman, when a man says no, it's the end of a discussion. And when a woman says no, it's the beginning of a negotiation. And so I ask you to go on a date, and you say, no, no thanks. I say, do you want to, uh, I'll buy you a drink. And you say, no, no thanks. How many men say, OK, and walk away? That's not what happens. There's now a series of processes to break that, that, that no down and create a yes. And if I can create a yes in that circumstance, when you really meant no, then I know I have someone here where I can create a lot of yeses. In other words, I can have control. And so if, if there were one sentence that I would speak to, uh, to young women, uh, or all women, it would be that no is a complete sentence. Mm -hmm. right? You are allowed to say no, and it need not be explained, and it need not be negotiated. And then for young men, it would be that you're allowed to hear it. And it doesn't mean you're not a... A, you know, a, a, a virile pursuer of women if you accept that somebody says no. And in fact, as somebody who's dated a lot, I'm married now, but somebody who's dated a lot in my life, I can tell the young men in the room that if you accept the no uh, the, uh, and, and leave that person alone, you have a far, well, you have an equal likelihood that she will make her way back to you at some time. 
particularly in a context like school where you're going to see somebody again. And if you're in a context where you're never going to see the person again, she really shouldn't get uh, particularly engaged with you. Meaning you're at the supermarket, and, and it's, not a, it's not a context that's an easy context for the foundation of a relationship. And I realize now there's also internet as the foundation of a relationship and a very uh, statistically becoming a very meaningful one. But to the women, I would say, when you say no, it absolutely must not be negotiated. Now, you may still date that guy. You may get into all kinds of funny engagements with him that lead you to wanting to go out with him. But when you say no about something, you stick to your no. All of us, you know, when a, somebody approaches you in a, in a uh, department store and says, may I help you? May I show you? Is there something particular you're looking for? I, I personally don't like to shop that way. I like to be left alone. And so I say, no thanks. And, and of course, in that context, they keep, they keep at it, right? Are you sure there's nothing I can show you? You know, we have a sale on such and such. Blah, 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 blah. No. And it's important to enforce your no if it was even worth saying in the first place. Otherwise, why say it?